Swiss Army knife. Paul, what ah. would your ah. sound be like a Swiss Army knife? <laughs> 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 oh, Ching. No, um... <laughs> Welcome to our first of our Small But Massive podcast. Today we have Paul Connolly and Dan of the Woodburn and Savages. Welcome, lads. Yo, yo. Thanks for having us. You just got here safely, anyway. We? we did indeed. Yep. We did indeed. Yeah. You weren't stopped or closed down or, you know, having to be wiped down every hour. We turn you go through. Like, Foot to the floor. They say there's towns you go through now and you just put your arms out and they spray. <laughs> and that's you ready. That's Covid you free. All right. <laughs> so... Okay, uh, thanks for coming, lads. And uh, this is the first one we're doing. And uh, I would say at this stage, for anybody out there that may be listening or might listen or might just not listen to us, they're all welcome, you know? So they're all welcome. And as I say, any good people out there after want to listen or send us in any messages about what's going on here, what actually is happening is Glasgow is a creative... Uh, centres, some knows, and we've had a past life and festivals and different things. This is, I suppose, about talking to artists who have been at the forefront of music in Northern Ireland and have got a story to tell, and hopefully we can uh, get bits and pieces of that out. Where I'll start, Paul, is in 2008, uh, I met you, I think it was like a, a one of them green huts, sort of, or like a, a cabin type place, and uh, the gentleman that was running it was Ollie Green. And Ollie uh, was a great uh, pusher for everything creative in, in, in Derry City, and especially the people of Gallia. And uh, when I went up, I can kind of remember uh, like a, a big uh, curtain or something halfway, and we were sort of planted in, you know, the music men on the other side. But it was actually, if I maybe can remember right, I'm not sure, but I think it was a boxing ring. Was that right? It was, I, I think it's called the corned beef tun. <laughs> I think that might be what it's called. Aye. So that was a, that was a boxing ring. I that is absolutely deadly because I know I heard groans and ugh, <laughs> all this type of training going on. But uh, and there I was at the other side, right, lads. You want to get a band together and all? You do this here and that. But I suppose Ollie brought me up at the time, from what I can remember, Paul, uh, to talk. At that time, we had started the festival, so he wanted uh, us to talk about or me to talk to you know young young people like yourselves. And there was a few people there that day, and uh, I suppose to activate conversation about how you get your band maybe to a festival and what it takes to get to a festival. And obviously at that stage, you were, I think you may have been 16, were you in 16 or 17? Or? Uh, about, I would have been a wee bit older, about uh, 17, 18. Oh, you're just, so. you just go right back to me. I was a big boy, actually. <laughs> actually, I was. I was wearing long trousers. <laughs> so, and at that time, there was uh, yourself, there was... Uh, Tom, there was uh, Brother Lee, yep. uh, uh, Thomas, and uh, there was Rory. And uh, that that became uh, uh, the queue, yep. as such. Yep. And at that time, had you sort of practiced together or played together or had any wee sessions together? I, at that time, we were, because I remember that, I was thinking about it um, whenever we were talking about doing this, but I remember we had just, I think we had just about started. Um, I remember me and Barry were sort of going through school together and, and Barry was Tom's cousin and Rory was uh, Tom's brother. So it was a sort of, the three of them were family. They were they were really thick as thieves and they loved rock music and stuff, mm. but they needed a singer. Um, so I'd never I'd never sung in a band before, but I, I at that age, I was kind of coming around to listening to records and, and finding bands like Led Zeppelin and stuff like that mm. and really throwing myself into it and loving it. But we were, we got together and I think all we knew at that time was that we wanted to be in a band and we didn't want to be playing anybody else's songs because... We just we just wanted to write our own songs about mm. what was going on around us because that seemed to be what the bands that we loved were doing. So yeah, yep, yeah, and and I suppose uh, at that time too, uh, down here at the back end of the festival, we were running the Rural Key uh, project, and uh, it was a wee while after that. I think uh, I got back on to you and said, you know, would you like to come down? And and uh, as I say, you were at the forefront of the Rural Key, and when I suppose me and Dennis Kelly, a good friend of my own, uh, was the tutor, and uh, there's people like John Gribbon and uh, Shauna Toho, yep. uh, who uh, is now uh, Ruse, Ruse and uh, Junior Johnson, Junior, Junior Johnson, yeah. and I suppose what you you're all 
uh, pretty uh, diverse in styles. You know, your junior coming from the whole Johnny Cash country, alt country uh, folk sort of uh, rock and roll type of stuff, and you yourselves um, wanting to tell a message about what was going on in your city and what was happening. And you had John Gribbon, who was uh, like a, a sort of a technical was kid, I suppose, at the time. Yep. You know, whatever went and all these sort of sounds and, and gadgets and all, but it seemed to work for him. And he was very confident in a sense, as you know yourself, it had been, John would have been one of the first using a loop pedal. Uh, yeah, just whenever whenever I think of John, I, th- I think that was the first time any of us had seen a loop pedal. And like yeah. we, were, we were all really, really different. But I mean, from Shauna, Shauna was, I think she was doing silhouette maybe just after rural care so that right. was the beginnings of That's it too right. so from her we you know we learned things like stagecraft we, we kind of learned off each other is what i mean to say you know junior kind of uh taught me a lot about the importance of lyrics and i i sort of became fascinated with guitars and guitar pedals because 17 18 is nearly a wee bit too old not not too old but a wee bit late to the party picking up an instrument usually people are playing from no age yeah but john kind of taught me like a a few chords and what guitar pedals did and you know especially like we were saying about loop pedals and distortion pedals and how do you, how do you use those so even though we were the participants um, and we were coming here to learn as, as well as get to know each other we were we were sort of teaching each other things as well and yeah um, you know becoming friends too there was good camaraderie and i think and una, una clark as well yeah uh, and i think that's that sort of came across on on the course and i think too i suppose for your uh, for yourself, the big fub was the release at that time. Yep. Uh, Trapdoor, uh, Magpie, and uh, Accident and Emergency. Yep. I always called it, but did I say that right? That's class. Now, at that time, uh, from I remember, that particular, the last song I mentioned there, um, it was a case of a carryout and someone cutting themselves, was it yourself? And then you went to the, the hospital and the, what you witnessed there was transported into that song, is that right? Or, aye, uh, aye, so we, <clears throat> all, our, all our songs were sort of wee story songs and obviously at that age we'd never really left anywhere, we'd never left County Derry, you know what I mean? If uh, the furthest we, we went was, you know, here, Draperstown or, or to Belfast for yeah, a gig or whatever, yeah. you know, to go and see gigs. The holy but, metropolis aye, of the, rock and roll. The big smoke. Yeah. <laughs> the big smoke, boys. Look at the ship of them boys there. Auntie Best and Uncle Buck, you know what I mean? So, uh, Auntie Fast, I should say. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, I suppose that's what uh, link in then, I suppose, in a sense, to uh, um, all you mentioned there, John and Shauna and Una um, and Junior. Then you all sort of shifted up. Well, you'd obviously done the showcases and then the G sessions and then you were up at the festival. So I suppose that was uh, where, I suppose, your first introduction to the festival. And uh, I, I suppose, in a sense, that's where the next stage where you had switched in was where we are now with the Woodburn and Savages. Yep. So that uh, was that transition hard, taking a band of buddies that was a band of buddies, you know, together. Uh, I know that uh, Rory was changing the drums, but uh, Tom and uh, Thomas and, and Barry yep. <clears throat> and yourself were all, as you said, they're a band of brothers from the city and I, I mean, it was kind of like it was kind of like the monkeys. Uh, we all, me and Tom and Rory, lived together for a while, and then kind of because we were all living together, that that meant that that Barry and, and Thomas Doherty were were kind of you know in the house as much as we were. So it was kind of like you know it was like some sort of sixties Beatles, you know the felt the hard days night or whatever it was where yeah. the Beatles are all living together in the same yeah. house. It was a wee bit like that. And we were all kind of... And you all had the hairdos and all that. We did. Yeah, I, yeah I had man, the, we've got the hairdos <laughs> for this. <laughs> I had the big pudding bowl Ramones uh, haircut. Like it was, lit, it was uh, like a bowl on my head. Uh, it was that, no, it, it, I, what I would say, it, it sat really coolly, you know. <laughs> and you all had... No, but... And even at that at that stage, even as you say, the band of brothers, you should have pulled up. Um, you all had your own wee image then. Uh, in a sense, you know, uh, I suppose Tom had had the... the 70s brown leather jacket Aye. and he got a cool look and and uh, he had a good stance I suppose and everything else but for that transitioning from that friendship into the where we are now yep. dancing and the Woodburn and Savages which was the first line out of the Woodburn and Savages um, it's a different line out now yep. but we'll, we'll, we'll maybe talk a wee bit about the first line out uh, which was if you want to tell the world, which was yourself and so, Shay Tohill. Yep. So it was it was uh, Shay Tohill on guitar. It was myself. Uh, it was Aaron McClelland who was who would have been the last drummer in the queue, um, and and then we we needed a bass player, and we were sort of struggling to, to find somebody. And and Aaron, 
I think Aaron bumped into you one night. And yeah, it was, it was, it was he Tom. He found Dan. <laughs> Dan, <laughs> let us know where he found you. Uh, actually, it's not in Wellerspoons. Oh, what was it in Wellerspoons? Yep. Dan, it's, were, it's you eating the, were you eating the famous no, Wellerspoons fry? They it's not about? as bad as it sounds. It just, <laughs> we had, a, we had a, a, a mutual friend brought us together. Um, but it was actually, it was Tom, not Shay, um, at first. Ah, yeah, that's what it was because yes. I know you came to me and yep. I, I know Jay was Aye. at that time. Yeah, yeah, and um, I suppose I just like I was sort of finishing up a music degree and then I was do- working with a lot of different people, playing bass and like doing recording stuff and whatever. But I didn't really have a band and I kind of wanted to get involved in the band. And then I just, you know, I met Aaron. He was like, "Yeah, well, we had this band, but we're kind of stopping it or changing the name or breaking it up, or whatever." And we don't have a bass player. And then like. I think Paul was out of the country at the time, and then the next week we we're in Aaron's folks' garage, and that was the beginning of the Woodburn Savages. You know? Yeah, yeah, and <clears throat> I suppose um, I've known uh, you, Paul, from a long time, oh, yeah. and uh, I suppose in a way uh, we've always been connected. And your whatever you have been doing, and whatever we conversations we have, and our we mad codes. You know, <laughs> the world out there will not understand some of the codes, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't even know if they need to know some of the codes. I don't actually know what some of the codes are about, but it's fine. I heard you, Paul. I know exactly what to do next. Uh, but at that time, uh, you know, um, I suppose in a sense, um, the music industry. When I look back uh, mm. to uh, back in the day when the festival started, uh, it was hard work to get um, you know agents to come and see bands or managers or or uh, people that maybe would have a bit of know-how. It seemed to be this sort of uh, mountain beyond that had to be climbed as such. Yep. How do you, how do you feel it is now for for young artists looking at that from back then, to where you were then to where you are now? I reckon anybody anybody who is the age that I was uh, now would see that as a completely different era, nearly a completely different planet. Because I think we there's maybe it's an Irish thing or maybe it's this part of the world. When we know we know something, I think we're too quick to say, well, I, I think, you know, and we nearly second guess ourselves before we say, I know I can be a manager or I know I can mm-hmm. be a band or I know yeah. I can I can be a festival or, or whatever yeah. it is. And then people are on festivals are we bit mad, aren't they? <laughs> uh, <laughs> people that go to I them are mad. I never met one, but trying to get <laughs> but people like yourselves on them. <laughs> but it's sort of it's weird because the, the, the landscape that we're in at the minute is there there are no gigs right now. There can't be any gigs, but it'll yeah. it will come back and it, it will come back um hopefully healthier than it was before. Yeah. Um I think it's 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 tricky for it's tricky for people to, to make a, any any sort of living out of it. It always sort of has been here because we we sort like not to get too heavy or too deep into it. But I think the thing about being where where we're from, people don't know should we belong to the Irish music scene, as in the rest of the island of Ireland, mm-hmm. or are we a UK concern? So should big swingers from London be coming over and, and saying, hi, I love your band. You know, or oh, should it Paul, be... you should see my scarf. <laughs> I love your band, but my scarf's no, really gorgeous. This is the Tom Baker scarf. You oh, know? man, it cost me so much money. Oh, I was taken into a room in London and, and George says, we are the biggest record company in the world, but you must wear the scarf. You know, and <laughs> you've seen that scarf. Yeah, I, I've seen that scarf many times. <laughs> I am the scarf. But, you are the scarf. Yeah, but, you know, it, that's, that's the sort of thing where geographically we're in a weird place and and I think now, you know, some of the bands that you were talking about there, they they had this sort of belief, you know, not not to make it really really Disney or anything, but you do have to have that. You have to have a bit of thrandness and a bit of a, a big bit of belief that you can go over and you you know you can take the ferry over and and you can invite these people. Now I think at the time it was all about a. It was kind of like the dark arts. You didn't know yeah. who to who to talk to or who. But I mean, there 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 are things like. You know, um, first music contact and in, in the south, and there's there's help musicians which are thankfully here now as yeah. well, and those sorts of things like output in Belfast that sort of bring knowledge. But I think, you know, I think people now are are better at digging because the internet seems to be a bit more demystified than it was back yeah. then. It was people hiding behind info at. You know, uh, yeah. bigscarefrecords.com, yeah, yeah. whereas now it's, you know... Big Slasher Malone Records. <laughs> <laughs> whereas now it's like, hi, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm John or Jessica from Big Scarf Records. Yeah. Come and, you know, come and, come and see me. So... Yeah, there's communication. You yeah, can talk to there's, people. There's more communication now, I think, which is, which is, which can only be a good thing. Yeah, and that, that's, that's right. And so just... Um, 
it's a few points I pick up on there you said Paul but the, the likes of um, I remember up uh, when you were up here and you were rehearsing mm-hmm. and that that stage of you uh, uh, you released America and uh, and next thing um, you got the call from uh, uh, Radio 1 introducing and yeah. uh, so you were off to Glast- Glastonbury with the boys uh, what was that experience like for you and Dan and and it was really, really cool. Um, I think it was one of those, it's, some, it's a festival that every musician will probably want to play. You know, it's the biggest, fe- it's the original festival, you know. Um, so It's, it's the, a granddad. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's the great, great granddad's, granddad's relation of the granddad. Exactly. That's what it is. Aye, yeah, so it's, yeah. it's like the big. It's a holy grail, isn't it? It is. Aye, if so there was a grail to be found, Mr. Evis, it would be in his back garden. Aye. With yeah. a cloak and the halo. You know? <laughs> and the scarf. <laughs> ah. So, oh. I, oh. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing being asked over. And I think that was, had, I think had we not been asked, maybe we would have gone the way of lots of bands where you kind of lose belief in what you're doing and yeah. you lose belief in yourself. So we were really, really lucky to get it. We were really, really lucky to find uh, that the likes of Tom Robinson on Six Music who asked us over, yeah. wasn't just somebody who was like, yeah, I like the music. He was like, I like this band. I like what they're about. You know, people need to hear this band. And that just that belief, like your, yourself and Stella have and, and the musicians that come here, yeah, that's curious. that's seriously important for because you can be the best songwriter in the world, but somebody not turning around and saying, you should record that and you should, you know, put it out, that, that makes all the difference. That concretes the thing, gives it a foundation. So, but to get... On to, on to Glastonbury, that was that was a great, great thing for us. And I think it happened at a time where we were still sort of figuring out what kind of band we were because yeah. of, like through the queue, I think through my whole uh, life as a songwriter from like the age of like 15, so that's like over half my life. You now. always had the wee book with you. Always had the wee books, always had the wee doodle yeah. books, you yeah. know, and, and always had... Doodly dee, doodly dee. <laughs> like all the time. Yeah, I know. Um, but it, it was always about causes and it was always about people and it was always about the underdog and it was always about challenge and wrongs and I think at the time when when we started the savages we we sort of or I I sort of thought it at least anyway and I think we we all sort of were on the same page and and still are that that's a big part of of our music and at the time there weren't a lot of bands doing that it wasn't the cool thing to be doing it was kind of you know wear your guitar really high and and get the swankiest top shop shirt and kind of. I know what you mean. Yeah, exactly. I think about shoes, even though you're wearing fucking slippers. I know. I mean, I know. So we we were singing about big things, and that like that that's something obviously that the guy who invited us over, Tom Robinson, has been doing his whole life as well. He's a kindred spirit to the band. The campaigner of the rights of people and the rights of individuals. Yeah. So we we went over and and I think it was really really good. Um, You know everybody everybody wants to go there and make a big splash and be the the hip new thing and and be, but I think sometimes there's a danger in that that you can be flavour of the month, and that can sort of taint the way that you operate as a band and and you feel beholden to writing the same thing over and over again. Like the the music that we're we're writing is, I mean, we've written folk tunes and we've written all sorts of things. And America is just pure funk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But people, people love it. And I think, yeah, you know, we kind of got, we kind of got taken the hand a wee bit sometimes in reviews. You should never read your own reviews. I think anybody. Yeah, listening? well, I'll not be reading any reviews about this. <laughs> 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 uh-huh. you, know, I would, you know, what I would say, the reviewers come in and chat to us. You know, yeah, one hundred percent. You know, I, no, so, I'm with you, bro. But I think we, I think the the thing that sort of runs through the savages is that we we never try and get bogged down in the flavor of the month stuff. And if if somebody has a record out that's good, they've put a lot of work into that. And I, I don't think we want to necessarily. We'll take elements of something that we 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 feel is amazing and and that we like, like everybody does. But I don't feel like we're beholden to anything. No, I don't. Like as I say, um, you stick by what you believe in, and that's uh, credit to the band as a, you know as a unit. And I think that uh, what you're saying there, uh, Tom Robinson, believing in you. I think uh, the whole crowd in front of you that night uh, believed in you. You had I know a guy Pedro McPedro who was your tour manager. Oh yes, uh, yeah, yeah. How did he cope on this tour? And what kind of a person was he to be along with you, Dan, on that tour? I, he was great, crack. Was Pedro it? McPedro? Uh, yeah, yeah. Did he know what he was at? I, I think he did. He yeah, had he had all his, his p's and q's. I know that all the gear away, was like. cleared away, and and the and the, and the, the, the stage manager was well happy when the next band member there was a big. Arrows, he told yep. me that they left all their gear on. So I think. 
um, for yourselves. That was a great experience, I suppose, how to react on a main stage, how to get on quick, yep. how to read up, yep. how to thank people. Uh, your, your mannerism was amazing. Pedro told me this. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, and on, and on that there uh, uh, front, uh, after uh, the Glastonbury, I know that Pedro also says you went out with your wristbands and uh, you told the people to come in and put them up at the gig. And I know you asked and people did. Um, I think uh, uh, what we should have said about uh, that packed tent was uh, that tent be empty. Yep. I think you generate a lot of people yourself. And uh, what you did when you're over there, what people should know was um, as soon as you arrived, you were out networking. It didn't matter that all them thousands of people could have been going to see on that bill uh, Dolly Parton or, or something. Or, uh, yeah, and, I mean, there's not many bands can say that Blondie was playing on the stage beside them before they just started. Yeah. You know, and because uh, I could hear, Denise, Denise. Yep. Dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig -a. Um, I think I said it to you and you looked at me and goes, who's that? You know, <laughs> I'm only 18. <laughs> but 18 that, was a, uh, that was amazing, wasn't it? And, right. and I suppose, um, and, uh, and to some, uh, a, a trip like that, it, it wasn't long after that, I think what uh, maybe the public should know too, and people maybe that aren't aware of the Woodborn and Savages out there or uh, aren't aware of what we, we're doing here, yep. is that uh, you took on the role of touring then as a band. Uh, you know, you started booking your own tours because that goes back to, I suppose, uh, we can come into different things that have happened after that. Yeah. But at that stage, you, you know, Dan was looking out for things. Uh, um, Pedro was sending emails to here, there and everywhere. Yeah. And uh, we were chatting away between times. Um, and the Belladrome Festival. Aye. I think uh, w what I would uh, I felt uh, at that time, and I think uh, you said it earlier on, Paul, um, Sometimes uh, an act just needs a certain person to play their song or take it and uh, do something with it and uh, believe in it, as you say, because um, out, of, uh, out of that, after Glastonbury, as such, you were saying, you know, Tom Robinson came aboard, but you also went over and done a few short tours of the UK. Uh, how was that for you as a band? I mean, that, that was a lot of, a lot of Dan's work was, was booking um, and... and just being a bit of a Swiss army knife, you know, driving and booking. Whoosh, Dan, you know? can you tell us about the whoosh, Swiss army knife? Paul, what uh, would your uh, sound be like a Swiss army knife? Over to you, Dan. Ching. No, um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's an era, like what you are saying earlier, about that kind of, I think that time is coming, gone. It feels like to me, but maybe I'm just, because I'm getting older now, and you know, that those are my... Early twenties, doing Dan, all that you stuff. Are you nineteen now? I, <laughs> but you know, like, like the whole that whole period of looking at bands like and so I watch here or Gas Can Ruckus or whoever, and they just like book a load of gigs and jump in the van and go and do it. Yeah, uh, it, there seems to be a real dearth now of, of bands. Like there aren't as many. It's more solo artists or people. It doesn't seem to happen as much, you know. And I think back then we were just a bit gung ho and we wanted to go out and play. And but that's that's the old seventies kind of I, attitude, which yep, is, yep. you know, at the end of the day, I suppose. Dan and Paul, what you learned out of that, that was that, uh, you know, we don't eat for three days. Uh, we don't really sleep much. We're on the move. What we do eat is sort of a regular. Uh, our <laughs> stomach's going to rumble and dumble. And there's going to be maybe, I suppose, what also is very important. When you're sitting in a, a van with uh, certain individuals for so long, you know, it's all right being in a practice room. Yep. But as, was that your first time of actually, live, you know, having to live in an HR over a period of Days. Probably ar around then, like around yeah. just yeah. before Glastonbury, and then the years after that until we released the album. Yeah. Like yeah, it was yeah. a lot of that, and it's like it does get tough at times because you have to deal with each other's like, you know, over over a period of days you start to figure out people's habits. It's just as people, yeah. And sometimes it's not the same as when you see each other three times a week or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But it's just part <coughs> of that. That's what I I think's good about bands because it, it you sort of I feel like you learn some life skills along the way and things that are. Um, things that everyone should be learning when they're in their late teens or 20s, you know, anyway. But yeah. it, it really forces you to be in those situations and you need to figure out how to, you know, uh, plot a map or, you know, follow the right directions or be in places on time and, you know, get accommodation booked, email people, get make sure you get your money at the end of the night. All da that stuff, Dan, could I know? say you're a strong looking lad? Well, and I'd imagine you come up there and just say, pay that money up, by uh, or else. You know it. What, what would be the words Paul Dan would say in a situation like, you know, to get the readies out there. Because there is, I suppose, um, like I read different stories over time about certain promoters and, and the the place to be packed and you're in there and, uh, oh, there's not many there, boys, you know. In other words, they didn't drink 
to they fell over, you yeah. know. But uh, I think that's changed, you know. And for you, I suppose, it's good to see because, as you say, you know, after help musicians uh, came in, uh, like after, I suppose, uh, you you have done the tour on your own. And I suppose at that stage, I would say that there were slight changes in the band. Yep. So do you want to speak about uh, the who was came uh, in and who sort of... Yeah, well, it, whenever, <clears throat> whenever, whenever we were going, I mean, it's kind of like a football team. You yeah. know, there's a, there's, there's, people that are on the field and then there's people that just want to move to a different team and yeah. there's people playing for a couple of teams at the same uh, time or there's people and then that there's just, veterans and there's veterans they and never leave the team yep and there's people that don't want to play anymore and that's fine they, they uh, want to pick up you know a different path path yeah. I, so that's something that you learn when you're in a band is maybe it's best to look at it like that um but know where the foundation foundations as there are um we i mean we had um Tom Nickel at the start and Tom wanted to uh, start a family and, and get into photography and he's doing that now as a, as a business and that's... Yeah, and that's, he's doing really good. He, yeah, he's yeah. doing doing yeah. really well and he's, he's, he's found his niche, he's found yeah. the, the, the furrow to plough um, and Shay was our guitar player as well and he was... So he, he joined us after Tom and he, he was making music with a band in Dublin, he was a bum. Yeah, that's um, right. And he, he was sort of having more creative control if, if you want to put a fine point on it with his, with his own band I think the music was more what he wanted yeah. to do um, he loved performing and we loved performing with him and making music with him but he again you know wanted to, to go on to a different team and that doesn't mean yeah. teams against each other it's just people doing, no, doing that's their being own. creative exactly and, yep. and I think as yep. you say there um, it's not unusual that sort of you would find that within structures yep. that yep. you'll um, and at the at, like to be honest at the minute the core of uh, Woodburn and Savage is no matter what types of bits or strings are putting them yep. bits are brought in at you and Dan? Yeah, now, and that kind of I suppose evolved from the new line out as such. Aye. and which uh, your two new ones is Michael and Michael Woods from Gas Can Ruckus. Um, so he's 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 a road warrior. He's a he's a lifer. He's, he's, a, he's a our mama. Our mama. <laughs> <Middletown. laughs> and and he's, <laughs> is he? Uh, he's a, I, like, like, well, um, Nicky's somebody I think that we both had a lot of respect for. Um, you know, looking at looking at his bands and the the work that they did, and they were definitely getting the van and go sort of fellas as well. And, and we've got Elliot Finley who was who grew up with Dan as well. So that's a nice connection to have in the band too. That they they already have. You know, they're on a wavelength humor wise, and that's by that's a really really big thing. You know that in a, in a band and any relationship too. Yeah. Um. And we all we all kind of enjoy the crack, and we're all very different, but we're, we all find a, a, a lot of common threads to tie us together as well. And Elliot's he's the best guitar player in the band, and he plays drums. Well, so. <laughs> uh, I would say you're a pretty nifty guitarist too. And for someone earlier on, just running back earlier on, you were saying about you never you know you didn't play an instrument. Yep. You picked it up really quick. Um. And. Uh, your uh, left hand just yeah. welder, and uh, so did you just wake up and go? Whoosh, I'm going to be. Ooh, I, I were you like a gunslinger? You fly it over. You're not going on speedy western. I, <laughs> I um, wanted to be jumping about with a maracas, being like, "I'm a jagger," but uh, like that wasn't going to last. Like, I was so. told not to stand up the seat. I was going to dance <laughs> with you there. So <laughs> I can see. No, come on, let's do it. Kind of doing <laughs> the bum dance in the chair. Show me a wee Mick Jagger there, even though we're in a podcast. Kind of and, wee. Whoop, whoop, but uh, whoop. yeah, all that, but. We again. That's the football team. Somebody, somebody wanted to to do different things, and, and yeah. I had to, I had to learn the guitar out of necessity, and I sort of fell in love with it then, and and sort of found found that that was a different. Like I was doodling all my life and doing all that sort of stuff, yeah. and then I found the guitar. And there's a really, really like I know this is really cheesy, but there's a lovely quote where you you go to an instrument to find out how you're feeling, and I think whenever whenever I started playing the guitar, I was sort of very ham ham fisted if, if if that makes any sense. Like I was I was sort of not very fluid on it, like you, it wasn't a big... You feel stuff. You feel I stuff and like then I. you sort of get comfortable with it and everything uh, and find your own clanky way of doing things. Uh, and, and I sort of fell in love with it then. So um, I couldn't imagine not playing it now. It's, it's become a really, really big part no, of my life. No, uh, definitely. And, and your show, uh, because, uh, you know, you're doing wee lead butts and everything. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. you're there. You know, you sometimes find lead guitars. Yeah, man, I do a wee lead and I just sit back. Yeah. I I'll go for a Havana stand. <laughs> I'll be back in a minute to do the middle eight, and then I'll hit six pedals. Yeah, you know. But you've got a bit of both. And uh, now going into the 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 live uh, thing for the Woodburn and Savages, yep. um, you're a powerful live a live act. And uh, no matter what anybody says, I've, I know very little people that would go and see you and not enjoy the show. And if they don't move. Um, 
their whole body. Yeah. Um, I would say there's something wrong with them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, they're not. They're not. You know. It's, I suppose it, it goes back to the earlier on you were saying about the movement of different loves for music. Yep. Uh, but I think like I remember going down there. Uh, I don't know. You, you were saying about output mm. where people. Um, you know the industry come now, uh, yep. at, at a, you know, and at the at that actual event, uh, and and maybe just before it, because I know you were sending music to uh, different agents and different things away over the and, and chatting to me and going, "Geez, you know what's what?" And this, but I suppose you're an example of uh, of a band that if you stick in there, yep. um, you know, you know, people say, "Oh, just." Uh, Keep at me, keep at me, and then you're thinking, well, you know, if if you were a punch bag, I've I've punched you fifty times <laughs> already, you know, with the amount of stuff I've sent you. Yep. But then you have to put in your, and you caught this on you and Dan, I suppose, and it goes back to that somebody believing in you, because it's very easy to get down, and people are saying, you know, there's certain people saying your music's brilliant, but they're only at a certain level, but yep. they know that you're strong, and at that next stage will come, and uh, I suppose uh, through. Um, the showcase in Belfast and uh, where um, you came along, uh, there was a gentleman came to see and called uh, uh, Matt Bartlett. Yep. And uh, uh, Matt's uh, agency is based just outside Glastonbury. Is that right, yep, Paul? Either. Midnight Mango, yep, isn't that Midnight right? Midnight Mango, just outside Glastonbury. Yeah. Uh, and, and what I felt great about uh, what Matt uh, uh, was doing was, uh, it was very hard, um, I think, back in the day to get agents to actually believe, to take on acts that at that stage had the potential, uh, and you instead of uh, yourselves after it, with a good album to do well yep. and to get to more people and to get to play to more public. And uh, so I think Matt was one of the those people that came over here and didn't wear the scarf. He wore the wellies at the festival. He wore the the you know the, the wets outside at, at, at events, and he went and seen you in a in a small bar or yep. wherever. Um, do you want to talk a bit about that and how that came about and what it's meant to you as a band to know that you've someone? There's the next stage of believing. Yep. You had Tom and you had Pedro there earlier on <laughs> <laughs> on two. <laughs> and if anybody's wondering out there, just send a a, a message in and we'll tell you who Pedro is. All right. Uh, um, if you look around the, the scenery here, you'll get an idea. We haven't seen the famous <laughs> saying yet, but we will do. We will. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, would you explain that, Paul and Dan, or whatever, uh, what that's meant to you, to be honest, uh, now and where you're at in your, you know, your career? So, it, like, I think we were, we were sort of hinting at it earlier about, about building, building a framework around your band. The band isn't just us playing on stage. It's, um, it's, it's people who have belief in you, whether that's a DJ or whether it's a friend who, who becomes your manager, in our case, with, with Peter Cinnamon. And uh, I think, you know, yeah. with, um, with Matt, Matt sort of took a chance and he's a very, he's a very forward thinking person. Um, I think he sees that a lot of the big scarf wears, a lot of the, the, the sort of... They miss the good bands. They miss the good bands yeah. because they're away quaffing the free booze. But yeah, like yeah, Matt, yeah. Matt yeah. did you see that booze there? Yeah. That, that, that beer oh. was flowing in from oh. Southern America, man. Booze. It's been brewed for 14 years. So great, that <laughs> It doesn't even give you heartburn. <laughs> <laughs> so so Matt, Matt's there. He's, he's there. He's a big music fan. We know that. And he's sort of become part of our family as well. Yeah. Um, and, and our own booker... Um, Henry Matthews, who who again is, is kind of like another another wing um, of of Matt's company, Midnight Mango, and he's he's our booker, and Matt sort of deals with a lot as well. They're, they're a team of people, and we know them all by name, and we've been to festivals with them, and we can have the crack with them, and they they brought us back to Glastonbury. They were instrumental in, in getting us back there. Um, but Matt Matt sort of is a very honest person. There's no nonsense with them, and and all the good people there is no nonsense with them, and they they call it as they see it. Yeah. So me and me and Dan. Uh, flew over, uh, took a wee one of those wee scary planes. You know, oh, the wee wee one, <laughs> <laughs> over the, over Actually, the you're sitting uh, as it, if you're sitting on the ground. Uh, all the time. <laughs> uh, we got one of them one time. We had to go to the thing, and I was we were sitting just before you go up. We were sitting looking out the window, and I was going, "Oh, look at that big long plane there, and look at that one." And like Stella's probably out there. And then there was one wee sort of in a bucket know, like, wee wings. <laughs> yeah, one wee sort of I'm in the real plane uh, in the middle, and uh, you could just imagine the pilot being here, step in the back there, and get ready. Yeah. You know, and then even you know the talk they always give you in planes. You're sitting at the back. 
you're the one to tell everybody we're about to go down. And like, I well, please it's, it's, hand out the sandwiches. So, did you feel at that stage? Uh, this is not a plane I want to be in, or did you feel a, great a being bit, in a plane? No, <laughs> uh, mortified, I hate plane. But um, we we flew over to Bridgewater, which is is the town that they're in. Yeah, and we met with with Matt, and it wasn't like a big Bond villain. Him turning around a swanky, swanky chair with a cat, being like, <laughs> "Hello, savages." <laughs> he, he just came in and he was like, "Look, what's what's your outlook? What do you, I think we were sussing us out to see if we were if there was any nonsense in us, and I think we passed the test. And yeah, they've they've taken like as I say, like Dan before was doing all the booking um, and then Peter came in and, and it was shared then but they have the knowledge that uh, Henry and Matt are doing that now it frees up time and, and people ours to, to, to be creative to be creative and, and that sort of helped us get the album more on track and everything as well so it's it was really a, a bit of a godsend for us at, at that time and, and we had the help musicians um, help behind us as well which was uh, uh, just uh, just on, on behalf of that one there, Paul. Um, <clears throat> I was aware of the help musicians. Yeah. Uh, Pedro was too. Yeah, <laughs> he, he was in the was background. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so um, the whole idea of the help musicians uh, was three of three. Yep. Um, um, there was uh, Sam Wickens. Yep. There was Ro, Ro from so Sam's from I think around Lisburn or somewhere. Uh, is that right, Dan? Banger. Banger. I think it's from Banger. Yeah. Uh, would you pronounce Banger for me there, Dan? Bangor. Uh, I love that. Bangor. Oh. Banger. Welcome to Banger. <laughs> right. Banger. So, uh, so and there's your you know just out of football fight you know <laughs> and uh, that one there is that last one does so three different styles of music. Yep. Um, three different types of artists. Um, um, I can't speak for um um. For Sam or Ro, um, uh, maybe someday I will be speaking to them. But uh, from looking as someone that be close to yourselves and mm. looking in, um, I think it was totally outstanding for yourselves. I think at that time, as you say, you had Peter as a manager, um, and you had Matt as the agent, and then you just needed the product, which was the album. The album, yeah. uh, and the album came out and. Uh, it was a stonker, uh, and for those that don't understand the word stonker, that means deadly. Those that don't understand the word deadly, that means extremely good. And those that don't <laughs> understand that, just go and fucking buy the album. <laughs> and then, uh, do you want to shout out the album? And uh, what uh, I know, I was aware Pedro was some yeah. of the songs you were practicing and all, and they sounded many times just saying, "Oh, get it out." And I know at that time you were building the network of the people you just mentioned there. Um, so, do you want to talk about? Uh, I think you went down to Rocky and uh, and uh, Belfast yep. uh, to to do the album. Um, a gentleman that is just a gentleman. And uh, uh, my first uh, meeting with Rocky was Rocky and Sean as Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer yeah. It was the first yep. time, <laughs> you know, uh, brilliant. And like a band that uh, um, got a few tours in America and different yeah, things. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, a man that had a dream to set up a studio. Um, sort of in a way by musicians for musicians yep. and for the growth of music um, um, in Northern Ireland and yep. I think uh, that's broadened now obviously you could maybe say more I haven't seen him in a long time um, what was that uh, and I'm aware that his studio is in an old uh, whiskey distillery I think that's what the oh yeah build, yeah, build yeah, used right, to be yeah. isn't that right that's what it was and I think it was an old catalogue uh, shop as, as well years ago them sort of I don't know the ones you sort of stuck stamps on and then you got uh, weird gifts landed to right. you oh my god I didn't want another hat or a <laughs> tea cosy aye a trouser press I don't know what a trouser <laughs> press looks like but they sound cool uh, with any of the boys you don't even have to iron your trousers you just go iron my trousers trouser yeah, press aye. aye it's like a big toasty maker sideways ah uh, George Forbin aye, so, yep, uh, aye, yep. <laughs> cheese and toast please on the leg <laughs> <laughs> trouser <laughs> press <laughs> But uh, uh, so, um, <laughs> treasure fresher, never be. I'm not saying the statement. But so, tell me what the experience was, with Rocky. Because I know I see up there at times, and he's constantly reinvesting in equipment yep. and uh, uh, amps and mics and old retro gear and yep. stuff. So when someone's doing that, um, I believe that they are totally. Um, what, what's the word? They're totally sort of, uh, and they're not involved, but invested, invested is the word, Paul, yeah. and, and the, the band. Yeah. Uh, so what was your experience with uh, Rocky? And was there parts when you were recording songs that, um, I'm aware of all the songs, but 
he did do a really good a really good job and uh, so what was that experience like for you for the first time I suppose being in a studio knowing at last we're going to get this album out and you worked many years for it. Dan you came in later on with Paul you were I think 18 and a half Dan that right yeah, uh, about, that. about that there and uh, Paul you were still 17 yeah, or 17 something. months <laughs> <laughs> so Tell me about that, just for people out there listening that maybe wouldn't have never went into a studio before um, and that, you know, you may have known the producer. Yeah. Uh, did you do a bit of homework? Uh, was he someone, did you listen to other bands he'd recorded? Was there other local bands? Did you hear a sound you thought, ah, that's really good, Dan, we would like that sound? Or even now, you know, when you look back, are you totally, you know, was it what you wanted? And, you know, and, and how was it for you recording it? No. So... So that was our that was our first album. It's our only album so far. Um, and working working with Rocky, I think, you know, we looked around and as we said at the start, there aren't a lot of there were wasn't a lot of studios in Northern Ireland. There's loads of they're popping up every month now. Yeah. You know, people in their houses and garages and things being converted. But with Rocky, Rocky is, as you say, totally invested here. He, he's sort of got that thrandness where he's like, no. This is my place. I'm going to make a studio here because if I don't do it, then what? Else, what? What is there? You know. Yeah, well, he's like yourself in your songs. He believes in, in what yeah. he believes in, and he's he's totally a hundred percent. Hundred percent. Yeah. So getting getting to work with him um, after we, we, I mean, I think we we looked around and we thought, let's let's try this guy out. And I it was, I don't think we knew him at all before we went in. And now I think, you know, he's he's definitely become part of the part of the family and part of the whole friend group of the Savages and everything as well. He's he's a absolute gold person you know he's he's mm -hmm. solid but getting to getting to work with him and I, I know dan has a lot of thoughts about this too it was it was amazing to go in and have a studio at your disposal because we'd sort of i mean you studied this so you, you might say it better but this is something that dan studied was recording and everything as well so I don't know. Do you, do you get in? Do you guess. think of Sonics and all that fancy I, words? Give like, me a few buzzwords, Dan. Like Sonics and compression. <laughs> uh, compression. Uh, no, uh, I know about gates. You know that open and close to keep kettle on. You know and that's how I used to remember uh, that. Sonic it, it like that sort uh, of uh, gate. Uh, 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 so tell us about that, Dan. Being into sound, right? And um, uh, all uh, that you, you would know. Did it sort of um, was it? It was great. Start. I think start together is a great studio. Um, lots of good gear. Rocky, like Paul said, is just like a solid guy. Mm. And we sort of didn't know him that well ahead of going in. But as soon as we got in and we started recording, we did like one small session as kind of like a tester. We did yeah. a couple of tracks. And I think after that, we were like, yeah, this is the guy and this is the place. Because half the battle as well is your personality when you're like working with a band or recording a band. And Rocky's got a good balance of like... Um, healthy crack, you know, few authority jokes here and, and a there. Bit of crack. Bit of authority, yeah. knows what he's doing. Yeah. And then I think... Me personally, especially, like I knew what sound we wanted, and when you, I think when you have a bit of a producer in a band, or you know that, it's so much easier to work with someone like Rocky. Then you have to, if you go in and you say, "Oh, we do this," but we don't know what we want, it's sort of like you could end up yeah, like just. It's like going into a restaurant other, uh, and saying, "Oh well, uh, I think I want the salmon, but you know, maybe I want the chicken." But sure, chef, just take everything and throw it in the pot and uh, see what happens. Uh, it doesn't work. So they call that a skaki down here. <laughs> That's when a, a multitude of leftover food is put together and you put a name on it and then you serve it up and Big you serve it up like as if you've worked all night <laughs> <laughs> cooking it. Hash, know? hash, uh, just get uh, it all uh, together. It's, it's like you know, beat up sausages, meets a bit of bacon, in bad form, and mm. you know, a bit of, <laughs> bit of toast <laughs> thrown on. You know, mix it all up. Uh, and uh, out the other side comes. Five star meal, well, Dan. That, that's you know? a five star album. Uh, if you ever get, if you ever get, see if you ever do take a guy with a scarf over, we'll throw him a skaki and you yep. probably go, oh, it's amazing. Paul. You know, <laughs> and so, so when, whenever, yes, Blumenthal special. whenever, uh, so Rocky was there and he, he had a bit of both, as you say, a bit of authority and a bit of crack, but that's his personality. And I feel that he has brought something special, I suppose, to Northern Ireland in the sense that uh, yep. not only yourselves, but he's, he's recorded some of our really, really good albums. You know, we could name a good few, but we're supposed, we're not here to name them all right. as such. But I know there's been a few over the years that uh, in my head that he's recorded. And then also... What you said there about studios popping up. I've seen over the years certain people popping up, uh, more so producers, Dan and Paul, Aye. than they would own a studio. Yep, and yep. that, because uh, there was one year I can't remember, I'll not plug the guy's name, you know, and it, but because uh, I can't remember his name yep. now, but uh, it'll come to me. And there was, I think, three or four album CDs came in and they were really, really well produced. And uh, 
that I suppose in itself is like you're saying, Dan, captured the bands, captured the moment, and really you nearly knew by listening, ah, this band's going to be really good live. I can tell that because you, you know, I suppose nowadays in studios you've got so many wee gadgets and tricks, you know, and it can make uh, singers sound. Um, I don't know, like a pelican crossing if they want, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is such a, a bird out there. And uh, But, you know, uh, what's your thoughts on the likes of that in studios? You know, because you're, a, you're a, a gang of guys, um, uh, we'll not mention some of the big bands in the world, but we all know bands in the world that have went into a studio, the singers at an SM58, and they beat the songs out, and they have give a bit of an organic feel to it. If the only thing they're recording is drums and bass, uh, you're the type of band like that, aren't you, that go in and... Uh, do you want to say a bit about why you do that rather than all go on separate and that whole taking 20 days to do, you know, half a verse, you know what I mean? <laughs> I think, you know, you can't, you can't be a perfectionist because perfection doesn't exist, does it? So, that it, it, yeah. it, and you could go mad, bands go mad chasing that and I think Rocky knows that as well. Yeah. It's as good as it's going to be when you know it's good. I yeah. think is if that makes any sense, yeah. but I think you know when it's right. Yeah. You know when you record something yeah. and you're feeling it and you're bitting it out. Because uh -huh. I felt in that album, he made you sing to the max. He did. There. Like he was like yeah. I, I, there was nights where I was coming out of there like your head was wrecked. I know your, uh -huh. your head wasn't wrecked, Rocky. Your head was wrecked because you were you were getting down to the grains uh -huh. of what things were, and and that's the way it should be. And he he so he's like. Again, like a sports metaphor, but he's sort of like the coach when you go in there. Uh, he's like, I know yeah. you can, I, I know there's another 5% in there uh, that's going to make the listener think, right, I need to go see this band now that I've heard this. But and you that, can tell that, Paul. And you do that uh, live too, you know, yep. you give it, you know, and uh, what I would say live too, like, you know, you, um, going back to really earlier on when we started, uh, issues are very important to yep. you. Um, your people, it's very important to you. Your yep. community is very important to you. And... Uh, does it give you a sense of you, a sense of well-being, being able to... Because I have been at gigs where the people would have, you know, they would have jumped inside a, a, a meringue pie and, <laughs> and cooked up <laughs> custard cream biscuits, just, you know, if you told them to do it. Uh, and have you, like, because I feel that that's... You don't get that too often, I mean, honest, I'm not rubbing your back uh, as a band, know, you know, know. Uh, uh, know. And that takes a lot of years of practice and uh, uh, to capture people like that and to bring them in. Yeah. Uh, I would say um, there's not many front men like you in Northern Ireland would capture a stage like that, to be honest. And uh, credit to you, you've you've Thank really you. coned in on your craft. You. Uh, is that something that, because uh, I know um, uh, it's like sometimes they say about singers, they need a big long lead because at any moment they're just about to whoosh, explode onto the crowd. Like, yeah. And you, uh, like at, even at Glastonbury, I felt one time, uh, Pedro's going to have to run here yeah. and he shouldn't be on <laughs> TVs to the world at all. Yep. And uh, But what comes over you at that stage, you know, when you get into a moment there's, like that? There's loads of things. We we spend a lot of our time, a lot of our free time and a lot of our life, um, you know, getting ready for gigs. And I think, I think you know, people, people go out and work jobs so that they can put a roof over their head and with any money that they have left, you know, for them to be buying a ticket, for them to want to come and see us, that's a privilege. That's a that's a, as big an honour as you can possibly give anybody to invest in a band. So I I don't think I don't think I ever want to go on a stage whenever we whenever gigs start up again and not give people exactly what they came for. And I think as well that we were talking about issues there and things as well. I think you know the world's getting a lot harder to live in than it was in, in the times even that we were talking about even yeah. ten years ago when yeah. when we were starting bands and things, but. Um, you know, people need a pit stop now and again as well, and they need to feel safe. So I think if we can entertain people and make them feel uh, good about themselves and good about about the whole community and and what they can do, you're. I think my my job isn't to to tell people what to do, but it's to remind people that they can do things. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's a big important part. I think it's one. Of, I mean, and and to be honest, I think it's uh, uh, it can be lost out there at sometimes in bands because you know that they maybe and like when um, you know you said earlier on about you know I, I'm the same as yourself. I, I would like to see things come back um, stronger and better and more organised and and more commitment from certain people. What do you think of of what has happened and? in the creative industry, what do you think needs to be done to support artists like yourselves and uh, take the thing to the next stage and, and reinventing the gigs live and, and maybe even, I suppose, 
do there need to be more youth gigs? Do you think do young people need to see more gigs? And what what's your views? And um, like there's there's a there's a lot to say. I could talk all all, all evening ah, about away. that, you know. There's, but there's it's, nobody it's... hitting me in the back yet. <laughs> anyway. I don't think so. Anyway. <laughs> but I think you know. I think um, once uh, government on you know all together realise that the arts industry is just that it's an industry it's it's not a happy dippy kind of thing where everybody you know it, the, the money that that generates it's like huge. you know the the thing that got me really annoyed and i don't know when this podcast going out but at the time um oh we're very efficient it'll be out pretty soon Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but i like re- recently we've seen that people were going to be allowed to go back uh, the horse racing and, and being spectators at horse racing and that's just because money can be made off betting and that really really annoyed me because if we have the likes of you know I'll, I'll not name any names of festivals because maybe they don't want to be named but if we see people working year round and, and you and you and Stella know rightly that a festival doesn't start yeah. the week before it starts yeah. the year before and, and that, yeah. that was like a full time thing to yeah. bring that festival to people I think it when, starts the next day after exactly yeah, yeah. yep and that that's a big thing once once governments learn the likes of that and and we were saying about all the staff and it's not just the musicians on stage who turn up 10 minutes before once they realize the impact that that has economically but more importantly the the impact that that has on people's well-being and health you know of course we should have more gigs for young people and we should be looking at all these empty shops you know, and all these places that are sadly now disappearing and, and the likes of redevelopment in city centres, the fact that there's no space at all given to creative industries where kids should be coming off the school to bus. To be inspired. To be inspired, yeah. like like we were at the Rural Quay. Yeah, and, and, respect. And, you know, and, yeah. and the, the likes of the Nerve Centre and, yeah. and, you know, and, and the OES Centre and yeah. everything like that. There should be more of these spaces and these empty spaces. You know, any anybody who has a building and they're not using it is holding it hostage. I think these spaces should be should be given over and people should be like like here here is break the, the chains break, and that uh, yeah. break, you know yeah. show people um how to how to shoot video show people how to be sound engineers because these are jobs these aren't hobbies these are things that pay people's mortgages and rent and, and keep a car in the road and food in your belly yeah. and once government realizes that you know they may never i hope they do then the title change you know sport gets i know sport's a very very important thing and it's it's a big part of people's culture and life as well but i feel like too often the creative industries be it art or, or film or music has sort of looked as at as a wee hobby yeah. you know oh, it's all right they'll be all uh, right sure he he has a he has another job as uh, well so what's what's your real know, job what's, what's your day job uh, you know actually yeah. i'm a songwriter uh, actually you know but you know that i'm a firm believer that everything absolutely everything everything is linked yeah. so schools education teaching you know I read I read something recently where it was it was a lady leaving her kid to school and she was she was leaving him off and he goes, Mammy, why do I only have art once a week and I have maths eight times a week? Yeah. You know, the, the benefit of arts and music to kids, um minds. I suppose it's like the STEM turning into hey, steam. Yeah, you know, steam, they put the art steam, in, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, but, and and that covers like what you're saying there, um, that would probably be a regenerative for for the likes of town centres and things like that. Yeah, totally. You know, people could get proud about something, um, something that they can actually touch and something that they can actually see and have a have a positive memory over. Yeah. And I think the thing as well is, um, like you know, in the we're in the northwest, um, you know, in a northwest county of of Ireland, Northern Ireland, you know, UK, whatever, northwest type of Europe. We're in a very isolated place geographically already, and sometimes it often feels like that. But the thing that music does. Um, whether you're a musician or whether you know you're a rigger or a, 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 and you know a new producer or you're recording in your bedroom, music is a medicine, and I think I learned I, I definitely learned that here, um, you know through the rural key and everything as well. And what what you know what it actually equips people with is problem solving skills, and it gives them confidence. And you know I think we we were chatting earlier on, but there was there was something I read where it was a kid asking why why do I have maths eight times eight times a week and I only have art and music once a week you know if we, if we can strike a balance somewhere where creativity is uh, encouraged as much as as this the stem subjects once yeah. government realize that you know I think we're on to a good thing then um and you know there there's to build resilience yeah, to, build, to build resilience and and to kind of let people know that they're actually worth something and I think you know that's that's a big that's a big big uh 
thing that can that can really alleviate a lot of the mental health problems that we're seeing in you know across all ages it isn't just for young people because it should be something that's available you know as it is here to people of all ages as well yeah. um you know because sometimes people can feel like they 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 can't be reskilled or they can't learn a new skill that's nonsense i think we we need to engender a culture where people can whether they're 18 or whether they're, whether they're 80 you know they can they can come and, and record a podcast record a song learn how to play guitar you know that 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 I think music is so much more than being on a stage. And I think through the savages, we, we really try to communicate that. And we try to communicate, especially in Northern Ireland, that there's no such thing as communities. I think that's a myth that yeah. uh, that some politicians, <laughs> you know, kind of uh, have, yeah. have made really nice. <clears throat> there's uh, just people. Uh, there's just there's just people. Uh, and you take them as you find them. Yeah. And you can only... And they come in all shapes and sizes yep. and forms and opinions. But at the same time, you are passionate about mental health issues. Yeah. And... Uh, like even now reading uh, the what's coming out uh, and what's going to come out is that uh, there may be uh, an even bigger influx of mental health issues and with more so with young people and being away from their friends and, and away from the activities. Like you said, they're uh, being creative in schools and all and different things. Um, do you think it's something that uh, maybe schools need to look at and bring more in or does it take outside influencers like yourselves going in and talking about creativity and talking about music and talking about songwriting because at the end of the day someone sitting down writing a song is the same thing to me for someone having to sit down and write a poem because it could formulate like a poem it could it is a story and it is a a, a feeling of time and presence of where you were um you mentioned your home city dairy um i know chatting to you um at other times uh, you're very connected to people in your home city and the whole idea of resilience for the people and talking to people and because I know live you talk constantly about you know we can do this you're not alone and yep. you keep reiterating that to the people um have you found, found after the gigs that people have come up and spoke to you about uh, maybe that you inspired me tonight I'm looking at something different that, you know because I would imagine that would be happening yep no, that that does happen. That happens. There was um, there was a few people came up to me on on the last tour, and they'd seen us before, and you know they they'd sort of told people about the band, brought people, and I'm, I think we're always grateful of that because it's it's yeah. New Year's here and here in the songs, but people come up and they're they're very open, and they you know I I'm not going to pretend that I I know how to help people you know massively or anything, but I can only go on on fundamental things that it's good to talk. Yeah. And I think growing up, we were always told there's no problem that you can't talk about, that can't be fixed. And I think it terrifies me to look around sometimes whenever whenever I'm I'm in Derry, whenever I'm, I'm walking around. And I remember growing up, oh, I used to hang about here. We used to hang about here. And that guy's not with us anymore because, you know, he was going through a rough patch and people didn't see it. And yeah. the, those numbers, as you get older, start stacking up. And they're stacking up in a way that they... they we shouldn't be going through this and nobody should be going through this feeling like they're alone. So I think it's it's my job as a, as a songwriter never to tell people what to do, but to tell them, you know, like we were saying, what they can do and the power that yeah. they have and remind them of that because... I, I I really don't want to go through life being cool and wearing the right shoes and, and having a wee <laughs> dee, 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 big scarf. But like that's that's not me at all. I, I just, you know No, it's, no, it's not so that's uh, that if I can make something with the band that remind people of, of the power that they have, then that's that's my job done and I, I can be happy. Uh, fair play to you. Um, now, I just, uh, I suppose we're uh, coming near the end of just a couple more questions. Uh, one I would ask uh, is uh, the Northern Ireland Music Prize, uh, uh, a couple of years back, um, you uh, um, garnered or gathered or uh, were given um, the album of the year and uh, best life act of the year. Like mm -hmm. it was double whammy. Like uh, you know, you have, we would have had a right to just jump off the stage, you know. But I know in Belfast you're worried they'll just do the famous <laughs> split. <laughs> You'd be the front man with two broken, <laughs> two broken wrists. You know, and the, the marsh pit sense they would have caught you. Yeah. But uh, how did that feel um, for yourselves? You know, because you'd worked really hard. I know that it was like ten years of hard work and graft and 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 doors being bumped and all that goes with that. Yeah. Um, could you tell a wee bit about after one and that? Um, I would imagine it's taken you to a new, you know, a new level as such, uh, a new platform. And uh, on the same breath, you won the best live act. And then maybe if you want to answer about where you're at now, is there a new album in the way, and yep. uh, how how is it going? So, 
when when we won that, I, I think personally, I was I was just happy to be there because it was in the Ulster Hall, and you know, Rory Gallagher with a check shirt and the Fender Strat was uh, what was going through my head the uh, whole time. So uh, I was completely uh, uh, tattoo lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I know, I know. <laughs> like a, a Jinx and all legend. That. Aye, like that. that all was, these dudes just melting so on that, that stage. Aye, yeah. So I was like complete. Like I, I felt like I was made out of tinsel, just jumping about the place, happy as Larry, you know. And then whenever we won like live, I thought, all right, that that's us. That's that's amazing. That's I'm happy with that because we put a lot of effort under our live show. I'll just have I'll have a wee beer now and go for a wander around the Ulster Hall. And then whenever they said that we'd won the album as well, that blew blew my mind. I wasn't Was wasn't, anyone's not in the vicinity, you know, like sorta of. I think we were all we were all kinda hanging about and you were there still there just ready to walk onto the stage <laughs> like, no, Dan, <laughs> Dan were you there were you, I, was, you, I was right there you I met their man with a scar I, I hey Dan come and speak to me now you just won best live act yeah. in Northern Ireland you know? Aye. How, how was it like you know do, oh, it's great it's great I just think I'm maybe a bit I don't know I can sometimes be a bit too cynical with things like it's great to win and it's don't like, do a doom and gloom no, Paul no, speak no no, no, doom no, and gloom. no I'm not at all it's uh, just no, like it's like you said we put in the hard yards for a lot of years yeah that I, I, I generally look back that album I'm really proud of what we made like I yeah. think it's a collection of strong songs and I love I love how it sounds and I think it you know it was deserved but then you kind of don't want to you don't want to focus too much on, on what you won you want to kind of look on to you know, what are we going to do next? And uh, it gave us a lot of momentum, I think, in terms of festival bookings. A great belief, and Dan. It, gave, it gives you belief. You know, great belief. You know sometimes what I mean? you, you need a wee bit of something yeah. back to kind of, to, you know, you know, when you're driving down that motorway, eating your Greg's vegan sausage roll for breakfast, uh, yeah. you, you need you need to think yeah. of that to kind of spur you on to do the yeah, next you're, thing. You're, you're like you're eating healthy there, weren't you? Oh, like, I, of course. Like I think always, always. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the thing that we've we've sort of talked about a couple of times about, I mean, we were chatting about Rocky, how he reinvests in the studio. Yeah. Every every step up that we take, it's reinvested in so that we can jump up another step. So when that album, when that album won, we were really, really proud of it. But we didn't, you know, the slaps in the back can can knock you over sometimes. Uh, and the yeah. thing that we we did was, you know, we we took it and we were very, very, very grateful. And it's, it, I I really like that celebration of the music that comes from here. And I I think it's like a big it's like a big gathering uh, yeah. where, because at gigs and festivals, you, you only see each other for 20 minutes where somebody's hanging out of the back of a van going, oh, we must catch up and we never do. And sometimes in life you miss these opportunities. So that's a great one where everybody's in the a same room. A network and network, exactly. Yeah. I, and, and to be to, inspired for young artists I, and, and for those that are more seasoned, to be in a room to inspire other people. And it's, it's yep. it, that's what rooms exactly. like that do. And room, rooms like that where people are, are giving each other tips on whether it's the best service station, you know, in yeah. the Midlands or, oh, don't go there, uh, it's a rip off or, you know, and things. Uh, and then people turn around and say, Big Joe's Diner, the best <laughs> chips and sausage rolls you'll ever get. And Ash actually Reds. vegan too. You yeah. know, you know, hey man, I want a vegan sausage roll. What? Name the place we're going to pull into, Dan. No, I can't possibly do it, Paddy. Uh, it's a secret. It's like, a secret. Trade secrets. Uh, Big and, scarf and secrets. You know what? And then I suppose uh, from uh, in that room too, um, you had people then that were looking at you as well yep. from earlier on, you were saying. As, and so where, after getting them awards, you're very grounded people and respect to you. Um, after, you know, you've got them and now the situation we're in now, like a, a six month void for everyone's lives yep. in general. Um, where are we at with the next album? Are are we are we sort of pre recorded it? Have we got just ideas or are we We're going to come out there to the public? You know, because all of us are ready to go out on Monday evening <laughs> just to let the people know there. You know, <laughs> and, uh, everybody. Uh, we we sort of said to ourselves this year is going to be uh, a time where we <clears throat> don't gung ho it. Yeah. And we, we don't tour England, you know, three or four times. Yeah. We we just Dan's gone through a lot of life uh life life changes as well, like good ones. Um, married and baby. Oh, and congratulations, everything. Dan. I knew that, don't I? But uh, <laughs> Pedro said something about it, but I didn't really yeah, know. Uh, you know, he wrote a postcard it's, uh, it's over there. <laughs> no, we, we, we like it sort of came at a good time because we knew we wanted to spend a bit of time focusing on writing yeah. more songs yeah. anyway. And then I mean, you can't really say the situation came at a good time because it's a terrible situation I, in a lot of ways. But yeah. What, I mean, yeah, what, what we've basically been, what we thought we would do 
uh, with this time would be, you know, get together. And then, as you say, everybody had six months lockdown. Yeah. I think everybody should be able to shave a year off their birthday now after this year just to cheer everybody up. And I know. Say, I'm not 60, I'm 50, uh, I'm, I know, I'm 18. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Like, you know, some people want to be older all the time. Yeah. And there's people now want to forget about the but six months to stole up. You stole six months so that, yeah. It's It was... I think it was tricky for anybody trying to make anything in a group. I think. Yeah. Um, I think you're you're seeing a lot of solo artists and songwriters kind of saying, "Right, sweet, I can I can do my album because I'm an army of one," and that more credit to them. But for mm. a band, for bands, things became uh, difficult. But now we're kind of kicking it into hyperspeed, and you know we're we're booked in, uh, you know to to start tracking the album in November, Brilliant. um, and we're we're kind of. <laughs> Going through demos and, and older ideas and new ideas are are, are being finessed. It's a wee book of dreams, yet. Yeah. Book of dreams, yeah. The, the, yeah. the we uh, what's it called? The Dropbox of dreams. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's an up to date version. Yeah, yeah. Twenty twenty twenty. you know, uh, someone called just a diary. You know what I mean? Yeah, it is a, the Dropbox so of dreams. Like that's so that's that's where we're at at the moment. We're we're kind of kicking everything together and, and bashing the edges off as we you know we we used to practice in this you know in the yeah, corn store and, yeah you know you and Stella oh you're welcome to practice us, anytime like you know? and that was that was a godsend as well I don't think you know I, I don't think the first album would have been the same album had we not had that space and time here and, and and everything and you know now we're, we're kind of doing that now Elliot's got a nice practice space that we use he teaches drums as well that's good um so we've got our, our own wee kind of savages cave and and that's sort of the 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 hub the now hub, for yeah. us is that's is, really good. That's, that's cool. Like that's, we, really good. that's that's nice to have. And at the minute, you know, it's that's that's cool. And that's where we're at at the minute. And I think we're we're writing an album that isn't stability part two. Yeah, it's an album. It's more about people, you know, on the on the ground and, and what. Well, you're very through. observant, and that's something that probably the last six months you you've been even more observant. I'm sure I, of what's I, been done. I think you know everybody's everybody's been in the house and they've been they've been. You know, uh, it's not governments or anything that robbed people and, and told them to stay home or anything mad like that. Nothing mm. like, you know, yeah. I, I don't buy, buy into to that. I think, you know, people have to be smart and safe and stay at home and, and everything as well. It's only right to look after everybody in the situation that we're in. But I think, you know, a lot of people are, are going up the walls and it's an interesting time because that's never <coughs> happened before here. Yeah. Um, so the Spider-Man effect. I going up the wall. Uh, exactly. <laughs> so everybody's you know, going through different things. And I think this album's going to reflect a wee, a wee bit of that, but, you know, a lot of other stuff that we're thinking about as well. And I, I think this album's going to, going to be very different from the first one, but you're still going to know it's a Savages record as well. Yeah. So it's it's everybody... I suppose every album, there's a certain element of maturity I, is going to happen. I mean, you, you have to grow. It's, it's, yeah, not no. going to be, it's not going to be the same. No. You know, I'm not going to have the pudding bowl haircut anytime uh, soon again. Yeah. Um, I would love it again. I might grow it again. Don't know. No, but, I, you know... We're we're gonna we're gonna make a different album this time, and I think that that thing for anybody who is a musician who's listening, where where they're like, oh, I don't know, I've got this song and like we're we're a metal band, but that's that's one funky rough. It's kind of uh, like well, make it and go and do it <laughs> because if you love it, then it's the right thing to do. I think too often we get bogged down and, and stuff like that. I know, you know, me and Dan in the car on the way up, we're we're chatting about this about albums that where, you know, people make them. It's a labor of love, and if you if you love something. Um, as we do and as as we're making and, and will make because um, it's yet to come it's yet to be put in the oven and everything but yeah but it, the, the embryo's there and the, the excitement there, for it's there the energy's for it's there and the, the concept of what you're going to put together is yeah. there aye yeah so that's that's kind of where we're well yeah and it's like you were saying previously just hopefully when we get that all ready that whole thing of being able to be in a room again the magic of gigs yeah. will we'll be yeah. back you know because yeah. I oh, that, that, that's I'm really coming. missing that. And I is. think people people Aye. are all really missing it for a lot of different reasons. So you know, I think you <coughs> you're totally right there. Well, um, it's been a great pleasure, uh, uh, Paul and Dan, uh, with you today in the Small but Massive podcast. Um, I'll mention to my far out relation Pedro that you were in the belt, and he made me too happy to know that he wasn't invited. I thought I'd seen uh, him somewhere. But, um, and for all the uh, good people out there listening. You can check out all the networks for uh, the Woodburn and Savages and Paul and Dan are the type of guys that just uh, send them some love and they'll send you some back and maybe get a chance to listen to some of their music and uh, where they, they've they come from. Uh, anybody that's listening out there, any good people out there, thanks a million. Uh, hopefully we'll be, uh, I didn't say hopefully, we will be uh, doing... Uh, Small and massive podcast again, and maybe down the line, Dan and Paul, when the album's coming out, maybe you'll call in for a quick uh, c 
cup of tea and uh, a vegan sausage roll that'll yeah. be from here down in the, the bottom of the, the mountain and Paul yeah. will have cups we'll, of tea. We'll get the egg off the uh, For all the people out there, we're just about to uh, switch over. Um, Dan and Paul um, have uh, ever so kindly uh, going to play us a few tunes uh, and then you can pick them up online down the line. Uh, and one wee thing uh, I suppose uh, I wanted to finish with, uh, two wee things. Um if you're looking at the tables here, uh, you'll figure out they're uh, in guitar shapes. And uh, uh, the one that Paul and Dan's uh, sitting at, uh, you'll notice uh, the initials. Uh, uh, could you read out the initials there, Paul? The T. T. W. B. S. So you can make up your own mind what that means. But I think if you figure it out, it, it says the wood born of savages. Uh, when we came in here at the start, we kind of got uh, uh, well, I did bottoms of tables from here, there and everywhere. And the whole concept was to uh, cut out uh, guitar tables and ships. Uh, anybody that comes to the gigs, there's flying bees, there's Gretches, there's all these different guitars, cool guitars. Uh, Paul's would be the only left-hand guitar. That's right. Uh, yeah. uh, if you notice before you uh, uh, bang us online, you know, a left-hand guitar. <laughs> uh, I'm well aware of that. He plays guitar in his left hand. Uh, so, Paul, would you like to mention about the table uh, for yourself and when you were painting it up and what your aspirations was you're one of the many artists that uh, <laughs> ever so kindly uh, took a table top and, and coloured it on I took, I took took it home with me and it's uh, so I painted the guitar that we took or I, I took over to Glastonbury the first time we, we all went over with uh, Pedro was there as well and uh, he, I, was, I, he was and uh, so I painted that and um, <laughs> it's got a, a phrase that we have uh always sort of said to each other this last this last few years and that's never be beat and that's, <laughs> yeah, that's another that one there. Well. <laughs> Paul you made that picture for Pedro and, oh, all. Aye, and aye. Uh, uh, he was ever so over the moon with that uh, he's quite an emotional dude and uh, so he got very emotional with that there and uh, he mentioned about being on the road going through wheels and all aye. and there was a few bumpy bumpy hands and, and there was a few <laughs> crazy drivers <laughs> over there too Dan and uh, so we had a sort of talk uh, in the van about uh, what we needed to do to get us to the next phase uh, before uh, we hit Glastonbury and uh, so um, if you look online and if you're ever looking uh, you'll know it's me and Paul or Dan and, them and the guys speaking because you'll see how Hashtag 78 tour yeah. and then Paul will respond with <laughs> hashtag 78 tour rolls on, brother Patrick. And uh, so, uh, thank you, Paul, for that picture. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Dan, for uh, appearing with us. So good. Thank you, Paul, for appearing with us. Thanks Cheers, to Nathan uh, for recording. Thanks to Kieran, who's producing it. And thanks to Nathan and uh, Stella and all the gang. And uh, till next time, uh, I would love to say, uh, fancy uh, goodbye in some other language. I don't know any, so I'm just going to say goodbye. And it's goodbye from <laughs> it's goodbye from me, and it's goodbye from him, and goodbye from me. Too. And if you're looking at any of the scarves or anything we chatted about, uh, there will be all online links to show you towards where to get that scarf. That who wore that time that famous scarf? Oh yes, uh, you can knit it, but it takes you about three years. The Iron Islands will never be the same. There's going to be so many <laughs> scarves made. So thanks for listening. Uh, take care and see you soon good people all the best give yourselves a round of applause Mick Jagger round of applause